Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami. At this stage of uh, range retreat, I have the opportunity to teach some deeper dhamma, <coughs> uh, pointing the mind to those areas where uh, Nibbāna lies. You might uh, talk about Nibbāna, you might read about it, but unless the mind is ready, that Nibbāna will be just uh, impossible to understand, too far from one's uh, experience. And in fact, one will reject Nibbāna, one will be repelled by the very idea of Nibbāna and one will make up all sorts of other meanings for that term, things which are more suitable, which are more comfortable (coughs) for the defiled mind, which is why that I'm always reluctant to talk about deeper subjects at the beginning of the retreat, when one is still calming the mind, clearing the mind of the grosser defilements. And if one cannot rid the mind of the five hindrances, (coughs) then basically one is not ready to even contemplate Nibbāna. One just hasn't got the the mental ability yet to penetrate into such a profound subject. And the measure of overcoming the five hindrances is the ability to gain a jhana. Certainly, the ability to gain a nimitta, which is uh, almost like a temporary (coughs) abandoning of the hindrances with perhaps just a little bit of uh, restlessness left and perhaps if a nimitta is quite dull, a bit of sloth and torpor, but on very refined levels. So it's why that if you cannot abandon that amount to gain those states of meditation. There's no real power to the mind and there's no experience to the mind to be able to to, uh, gain those insights. Remember that uh, the usual definition of Nibbāna and the way people understand it is uh, giving up all attachments. And these aren't just ideas It's not just on (coughs) an idealist level that you give up some mental ideas and start saying Nibbāna and Samsara, it's all one. That's just thinking, that's just papancha, that's just ideas, it doesn't work. You can test sort of one's degree of attachment and ability to let go just by how deeply one can go in meditation. (laughs) <laughs> to gain a jhana, you have to let go of your body. Fully you let go of the body. To the point of the five senses being completely inaccessible to the mind. That sound, sight, smell, taste, even physical touch becomes inaccessible to the consciousness for that period of time. That's a degree of letting go. (coughs) And that's possible. That's what a jhana is all about. That's what you would experience when you get into those states. Or rather, that's what you'll notice about the experience once you emerge from those states. The body has gone. I think that's one reason why (coughs) my teachers in Thailand, the Kuba Ajahn of the forest tradition in northeast Thailand, would spend a lot of time teaching their disciples on the reflections on the body, on the mindfulness of the body. 
and teaching them that reflection, that mindfulness, that contemplation as a way of weakening something which is a very deep attachment. <coughs> Sometimes people think that you know, they've got rid of that, they're not afraid of death, they're not attached to the body, but they still have wives and children, they still have uh, cars and comforts, they're still looking for more and more security where there is none in absolute truth. The other way is to contemplate this body to the point of just seeing it as <coughs> just part of nature, nothing to do with you, full of suffering and not something which is worth attaching to by developing a sense of uh, understanding and nibida, this repulsion uh, to this thing we call the body, realizing that it's like a pit of uh, <coughs> pit of slime. It's uh, very hard uh, to deal with this body. It gives you a few moments of pleasure, but a lot of moments of suffering. When we were doing the the chant a few moments ago of the fire sermon, when it got to the point of uh, the ganda adita, the nose is on fire. I could really relate to that because I've got hay fever at the moment. My nose is very much on fire at the moment. And this is not just a joke because the body has always got some irritation to it. And by the body I don't mean just the physical feeling in the body. I mean all of those five senses which are connected to the body, which are part of this body, which are <coughs> supposed to give pleasure to this body, but just give irritations. And I think that's one reason why the great teachers in Northeast Thailand would keep on pointing to the fact that this body is not something which is worth uh, celebrating, it's not w something which is worth spending too much time on but to find some way of dropping this burden of body and five senses and allowing it to go, allowing it to disappear, to vanish. <coughs> and of course, if one identifies with the body, if one thinks it's mine, or if one celebrates this body to the sense of being proud of this body, then of course it's very difficult to let it go. Whenever there is a sense of self there, there's a sense of mine. Whenever there's a sense of mine, there'll be a sense of craving and attachment. The stickiness of the sense of self. It's as if that when one lets go of one's possessions, one is getting rid of something which is an inherent part of oneself. That's why you can always tell what you're attached to, by how willing you are to give it up. How willing you are to give up your little pleasures of life. How willing you, are, willing you are to give up your very life with this body for the practice of Nibbana. If you can't give up your body, what can you give up? So this has to be one of the first tests of the practice to see whether there really is an upadana there to the five senses, the Kamupadana, which is basically the attachment to this physical body of ours. All the thinking and philosophizing won't get you to that point. It has to be an experience, knowing that you can separate the mind from the body. You can disassociate. You can put the body down, sitting down. You can sometimes be sick, be tired, be too hot, be too cold doesn't matter, you can sit there and just abandon the body. The way to abandoning that body is the path of practice which we teach here. It starts, it has to start with morality and virtue. It's the first part of renunciation, renouncing the world of, in which the body plays around. It's renouncing the playground, <coughs> the swings and the roundabouts where the body plays. So renouncing by practicing virtue, renouncing by practicing sense restraint, 
<coughs> renouncing by practicing contentment with little santuti, renouncing by developing that mindfulness, that sati sampajanya, which is an act of renunciation to be mindful. You have to let go of so much. And then renouncing the body with its five hindrances. To be able to renounce that, we have a path, the path of meditation. And you start by letting go of the past and the future. If you can't do that, why not? It's because you're attached to that. You think there's some importance there, some value there. It only has the importance and value which you give it. That's called upadana, that's called craving. You make it important. In your moments of greater lucidity and wisdom, you all realize that the past is completely gone and whatever we remember of it is very inaccurate. The future, who knows what's going to happen next. We waste so much time there. We know that in our more lucid moments, but most of the time when mindfulness is not very strong, we forget. We just wander off. We have to renounce that. We have to renounce thinking. All these great thoughts or stupid thoughts, the fantasies, the dreams, all the great ideas, all the great thoughts about Dhamma which you have all tend to be false when you actually see Dhamma. People have written books to become famous, all the philosophical (coughs) uh, proliferations about Dhamma and all the arguments about those proliferations of Dhamma. They're all wrong, all miss the point, all born of thinking, not not experience. It's usually the restless ones which write the books. They've got nothing else to do. However, (coughs) when one lets go of all that thought, one realises one is detached from something. If you can let go of thought easily, it's a test that you're not attached to that thought. It's not important to you. It's not valuable to you. Why is thinking invaluable? Because again, it's mine. It's an expression of ego, the self, me. That's why people want to write those books. Every book should be called My Thoughts by Me. We all have the same title. When you let go of those thoughts, you have to let go the next thing of diversity. Get onto one thing, the breath. So I was mentioning to someone a little bit earlier, the breath is the last part of the body. Probably it's one of the first parts which you're aware of. Breathing. as You have life when you come out of your mother's womb. The last thing, your last breath before you die. It's also the last awareness of the breath before you leave the body completely alone. You've abandoned something once the breath disappears and the nimitta arises. (coughs) A nimitta is no more than a reflection of the mind, like seeing your face in the mirror. But it's a sign that the body has disappeared. That's why you cannot get into a jhana without the body disappearing. In the same way, it means that you cannot gain these jhanas without going through the nimittas. It's just a natural process. When the body disappears, you're left with the mind. In the same way, when somebody dies, they all, those people who remember that time after the last death, or they come back again, they remember floating towards the light. That's just a nimitta. The mind manifesting as the, the body dies, even only temporarily. This will be a first experience of Nibbana. It's experience of Nibbana because something has ceased, which is what Nibbana means. It means that something has disappeared something which was previously fundamental to one's experience of life, is no longer there. The body with all its senses, you come to the realm of the mind. (coughs) 
This gives you the indication of what Nibbāna means in the time of the Buddha when the candle would go out it would be called the candle Nibbāna it was why that <coughs> according to the legend the Bhikkhuni Kisargotami the one who lost her, her son and who had the parable of the sesame seed when she became a Bhikkhuni according to the I think the Terigata that she was meditating on a candle flame when a blast of wind blew that candle flame out it nibbanaed and she realised the metaphor there there's something going out <coughs> what was going out with the candle flame was just something which had come together through the oil through the wick, through the heat which we call flame when you get into a first jhana, that which we call body, you see that it's just something which is just parts. And only when the consciousness receives those parts and is interested in those parts do we get the bodily consciousness through one of those five senses. When there's no interest there, the whole thing disappears. And there's a sense of something going out. It would be amazing if there was a flame always there and then suddenly it just disappeared. This is what happened. Something which we thought was always constant is now gone. The whole point of Nibbāna of something disappearing is also seeing the emptiness of these things. That they can disappear. If there was something essential there then obviously it couldn't disappear start to see that the flame is just like a magician's trick all these elements coming together giving the illusion of something solid something real when it completely disappears we understand that it wasn't real at all the same with this body we think this body is real something important to us something we identify with and then it disappears and we realise that it's nothing to do with us at all. Not me, not mine, not a self. <coughs> Those experiences which you get in jhana are very powerful. But more than that, the very fact that the hindrances have disappeared gives you that stillness of mind and that power of mindfulness to really make something of that experience once you emerge. The power of the mind is very much the build-up of enormous energy. For those of you who have problems with energy, especially mental energy, you'll always experience that whenever you have a deep meditation, that you have such an increase of energy, of mental energy. And you can imagine, if you haven't achieved the jhanas yet, what it would be like that you to get one of those deep jhanas and to emerge afterwards. It would be just so bright and brilliant. When the Buddha talked about the Pabhasara Jitta, the radiant mind, the brilliant mind, which is, I prefer that translation, not radiant, brilliant. That brilliant mind, the nimitta is brilliant, but it also carries the meaning of being very penetrative, very wise. <coughs> and that brilliance stays after you emerge. And that brilliance which uh, is there from when you emerge from a jhana just illuminates whatever you observe. And if you observe in the right places, you observe the cessation of the five senses. You observe the cessation of the doer, the will. You start to realise that these things aren't mine, aren't me. They have ceased once, they can cease again. Five consciousness types have ceased. 
Surely the sixth type can cease as well. You start to understand that whatever arises, that can all cease. Yang kinchi samudaya dhamma, sabantang niroda dhammanti. <coughs> what that means is not just things out there in the world, things out there in the world which arise and pass away, like your lunch. It arises and passes away very quickly for some monks, they eat very fast. That's not what it means, worldly things. Yang Kimchi Samudaya Dhammang means the five khandas arising and passing away. It means the five senses, they arise so they can all pass away completely, forever. The five senses can rise and completely pass away, so can consciousness all the five consciousnesses and the sixth consciousness as well, you can see, can rise and pass away completely. You can see the mind can rise and pass away completely. The mind too is something which is a samudhiya dhamma, is subject to an arising. Therefore it can cease. Niroda is not suddenly cessation. It's not just something which is just flickering, but Naroda is something which is ceases and ceases for a long time, <coughs> which is what you experience in jhanas. <coughs> the five senses, they disappear not just for a moment, they disappear for long periods of time. The deeper the jhana, the longer you stay. Not because of effort, but simply because you cannot come out. It's this nature, it's a natural process, it's just the way things are when you let go. This is the nature of letting go. This is the nature of abandoning attachment, loosening the, the fetters which tie you to the wheel. This is what everyone goes through. As you loosen up those fetters, and all these things, you see that they, they can stop for long periods of time you realize that all the five candas, all the six senses, all the wills, every sankara that ever was and could be, as it says in the Anatalakana Sutta, of each of the five candas, whether gross or fine, far or near, internal, external, in all of these candas, not me, not mine, not a self. They rise, they cease. And that gives you the insight. If all these have a nature to arising, all these must be of a nature to cease one day. They must cease one day. If they cease one day, they cannot be mine. You see deeply into anatta. You see cessation, you see ending, you see Nibbāna. You see that all these things have to end. They, first of all, you see they can end. It's possible to end. Then you know they will end. You see that there's nothing in here which is you, which is permanent, which is always going to be here. You see cessation of everything, the whole of Sabe Sankara. And that's why you can say afterwards, ah, you can understand now, all of these five candles, all of these six senses, everything, far and near, cosmic or internal, whatever, gross or fine, <coughs> all of these are of nature to cease. They will cease. They can cease. There cannot be anything in here. Seeing that degree of emptiness, that degree of cessation, that degree of Nibbāna is enough to make you a stream winner. Not to think about it, not the words, but see the experience. Once that happens, once the mind has seen that, then Nibbāna becomes understandable and becomes possible for you. As long as you've got even the slightest uh, view of a self, of a me, of a mine, 
of a being, of a person, of a self, of a cosmic self, or a universal self, or a unmanifest consciousness, or anything else which bears the title of Atta, which is essential, permanent, always there, and there can never be any freedom. There can be never be any letting go. There can never be any cessation. There can't be any Nibbana. Because of that belief in the self, one will always be holding on. And because one is always holding on, there will always be suffering. That's the great carrot in Buddhism which keeps you moving forward. The very fact that having a self is suffering. The bigger the self you have, the more suffering you have. The more you let go, the more freedom, the more happiness, the more joy you feel. It's really strange out there in the world that people want to attach to more and more and more. <coughs> and they think that's going to make them happy. Even some of the Anagarikas think that they're going to be happier once they leave this monastery. You're going to have trouble out there. No one can stop you. So I'm not trying to stop you, I never will try and stop anybody. We are picking up more burdens, picking up more suffering. Why? Because there would be more business, more doing, more things, more encumbrances, more afflictions for the mind. Going in the opposite direction, the direction of letting go, abandoning, having fewer possessions, having less will. Sometimes we always think we want freedom of choice. We want freedom from choice, not freedom of choice. Because choice is very much craving, desire, aversion, preferences. Those are the chains and the handcuffs of the prison. But people in the world, they polish those chains and handcuffs and call them jewellery. And they delight in those handcuffs. They delight. I see Thai ladies coming here with all these handcuffs on them, all these gold things around their wrists. And these, they even have chains around their necks, tying them down, even on their ears as well. That's suffering, if you look upon it in the, the way of Dhamma. It's attachment, it's craving, it leads to more suffering. When you give up more and more, you find it leads to, to bliss. It's one of the beautiful things about being able to go on retreat. You can let go of so much. The more you let go, the more bliss you feel. The best bliss in the whole world. When you just sit down in your hut, with no jewellery, with no TV, Sometimes people think you aren't free at all, like being in a cell, being in a prison, not going out. But give me the world or give me my hut for two weeks. And I'll always choose my hut for two weeks. It's the bliss you can experience in deep meditation. And why that bliss? It's the bliss of letting go. The Buddha called the jhanas, Nekama Sukha, the bliss of renunciation. He called it Sambodhi Sukha. Sambodhi is the word for enlightenment. It's a bliss of, of, enlight a bliss of enlightenment. He did sometimes call it Nibbana here and there, here and now. An experience of deep cessation, of things disappearing. It's, it's the first time when things have really disappeared and gone. Important things. And it's so wonderful to have things go. The experience teaches the mind. It teaches the mind not through a talk or through theory or through reading a book. All of the talks which I've given are worth so little. All the Dhamma which the Buddha has taught are worth so little compared to one experience. Because when you have that experience you're seeing where all those words are pointing to. You're actually there. You realize why these things are called Nibbana here and now. Why it's Nekabasukha, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of enlightenment. <coughs> because this is what enlightenment's all about. 
Nibbana is bliss. When things disappear, the more it disappears, the more bliss it becomes. And quite frankly, the experience is very often like you don't know how on earth you can handle so much bliss. Every year it's more and more that you're going to burst. But the mind is very strong. You can take as much bliss as you want. And I'm talking about states of happiness which far exceed anything you've ever experienced in the world. Even if you have your own personal harem, <laughs> even <coughs> if you have uh, handmaids, handboys, whatever, just serving you every moment of the day, whatever food you want, don't have to work, whatever you want in the whole world, nothing is worth to use the Buddha simile, a sixteenth part or a sixteen millionth part of the bliss of renunciation. And it's that's the carrot which leads you into seeing. <coughs> it's the carrot which leads you to let go, to abandon and to understand Nibbana. Nibbana, the Buddha said, is paramang sukhan, the highest happiness. You realise what Nibbāna is. It's the ending, the cessation of the five khandhas. It's the ending, the cessation of the six senses. It's the ending of perception and feeling and consciousness and body and form. Ending of everything. Sometimes people, when I talk like this, they say that's just like absolute spiritual suicide. You can only be suicide when there's somewhere, someone to kill in the first place. Like the simile of Alice in Wonderland with a Cheshire cat. See, when I said that many years ago, I got the simile a little bit wrong because it wasn't actually the Cheshire cat appeared in the sky, it was just its head appeared in the sky. And it was the Red Queen, not the White Queen. The Red Queen sort of told her executioner to off with its head. And the executioner quite rightly said, how can I chop its head off when it's only got a head, hasn't got a body? You can't chop someone's head off when there's only a head and not a body. Same way, you can't have suicide when there's no one there. You can't have ex sort of annihilation when there's nothing there. There never was anything there. Just a play of illusion. And <coughs> we can say that and sometimes that people have even made livelihoods of saying these things, writing books about these things, but they can't practice these things. It's just ideas and words. The point is, it's in the experience that you know. And the only way that you can be sure that experience is to gain those stages of letting go. Stages of letting go they're just stages of getting closer and closer to Nibbāna. Closer and closer to things disappearing. Closer and closer to the flame going out. <coughs> That's what Nibbāna means, just the going out, disappearing, ending. That's why in the, the usual uh, description of the process, and again, this is all just a process, a natural process. It will happen to you sooner or later. If not sooner, then later. This is what's your destiny. I'm going to tell the future, this is what's going to happen to each one of you in the course of time. Maybe this lifetime, many, many lifetimes, maybe the next eon or whatever. What's going to happen to you is through samadhi, through the jhanas, you're going to see things as they truly are. Yata bhuta yana dasana to see that yang kinchi samudhiya dhammang sabantang niroda dhammanti that all this thing which you thought was you, my body, my mind, my consciousness, my ideas it's just things which have arisen, they will all disappear all your very best thoughts will not be remembered no one else will remember them, you won't remember them even if someone writes a book about your thoughts sooner or later it will all disappear I was really interested to read in one of the English newspapers that the 
the British Library. I always remember that because they would put every book which was ever published in Britain on their shelves. Every book. <coughs> and now they're just a little bit of a scandal. They found out that they've got so many books that they've been clearing the shelves and throwing them away. So they haven't got every book. Some books have been disappearing. And no one's got a copy of them. All that hard work of their authors, now it's completely gone, disappeared. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. All the great works will one day just be swept off the shelves of the Library of Congress in the US or the British Library or the French Library, whatever. All those great works will completely disappear, be wiped off the face. No one will remember them at all. No one will remember you and all what you did and all what you're responsible for. All your great works, 100 years, 200 years, no one won't remember you at all. Even if you become famous, even if you become an arahat, how many arahats between the time of, you know, like Venerable Ananda, and recently through that twenty, how many arahats do you remember? Names that you know. Most of them have completely disappeared. You don't even know they existed. And those are great beings. As for you, you've got no hope of being remembered at all. All your great works and your great thoughts and your great ideas completely vanished. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Cessation. (coughs) Seeing things as they truly are through through samadhi will lead to nibbida. As we kept on chanting in the Anatalakana Sutta, when you see that (coughs) all the six senses are on fire and The six sense consciousnesses, including mind, is on fire. And everything perceived by these things, everything felt by these things is on fire. You get nibida to these things. You're not interested anymore. Because you're not interested comes viraga. Comes the fading away. The intensity of experience starts to fade. Where before the experience would be very intense with sex, fine food, exciting music, intensity starts to get less and less and less. And you just want to be quiet, you just want to be simple. You don't want so much sensory impingement. It's as if you're turning down the amplitude of the world gets softer and softer. The world doesn't come into your mind so much. It begins to fade away. All of your wishes and dreams and desires fading away one by one until there's very few left. Food, going here, going there, even wanting to be healthy. It's all fading away. All of those dreams and plans and desires completely gone. Isn't that wonderful when all your dreams and plans and desires are completely gone? You've got nothing to do then. You're free. How busy you are. Even in a monastery, how much busyness each one of you has filling up your day. When will there be an end of all that busyness? Only when there's an end of desire, end of craving, end of attachment. When it starts to fade away more and more and more. And so there's absolutely nothing to do. Just sit there. Disappear. Just bliss. Viraga leads to Niroda. Fading away, you start to experience cessation more and more. When the world fades away, nimittas arise. Five senses fading away. A nimitta arises for a while. Then it's all the world comes back again. You can't hold the nimitta. Five senses are faded, but they're not faded out enough yet. A little bit more seeing things as they truly are. A little bit more <coughs> nipida. Not really concerned about this world out there. And the more that Niroda appears, the more things begin to cease. As the world stops, it's like the flame just spluttering. It's about to go out, but not quite. The fuel hasn't quite all extinguished. 
So a bit of viraga, a bit of niroda. But after a while, the viraga fades away, and then niroda. Things cease. Once things cease, we start to see and understand what nibbana is. The process becomes then seen the Dhamma and just little by little the whole thing stops and ceases more and more. Until you know that it comes to a, a certain degree of viraga, a certain degree of niroda, that you know that kina jati, you know that it ceased so much that all of the attachments, the cravings, they've all gone. They've faded away completely. And you know that this is your last life. There's no more birth after this. <coughs> All you have to do is just wait. There can be no more picking up of things. There can be no more craving. You've seen through the stupidity of existence. Craving, promising you happiness, but delivering you suffering. The attachments, promising you security, but just giving you more and more problems. You find letting go, giving up, abandoning, not just what's out there, but abandoning what's in here. Not just abandoning the objects of craving, but abandoning the one who does the craving, the doer. Not just abandoning the objects of attachment, but abandoning the thing which picks it up in the first place, the illusion of self. So all of that just disappears. And then you know, you know it because you know cause and effect, seen very clearly, why rebirth happens. Because you want this body. You want some sort of body. That's why you get reborn again. Or you want some sort of mind. Get reborn in the Rupa Loka or Arupa Loka. This is the stupidity, the awija. Once that is seen through, you know that that which causes rebirth has gone. That attachment, that craving, completely, the source of it is completely gone. There's no way it can arise again. Once you've seen it, it can't come back again. If you've truly seen it, things have ceased. The fire has gone out. You can't sort of kindle it again. Once that fire has gone out, it's obvious, insight comes, kina jati, <coughs> birth has been destroyed. Future birth. And you just become like it says in the Teragata, just like a workman waiting for their wages. Because you know that this Five candles still going on according to karma. Soon it will end. When it ends, there will be no more. Keeping going just for the sake of the teaching. Keeping going for the sake of having other people offer arms and get that great merit of giving to an arahat. Keeping going just out of compassion for the world. And the greatest compassionate act a person can do is to be an arahat and to continue for a while for the great compassion for the world. And then at the end of that lifespan when the arahat completed their duties when the karmic forces means that this particular group of five candors is worn out, that Rupa just ceases and doesn't arise again. Vedana just goes out like a candle flame, never to arise anymore. Perception, always interpreting this, judging that, it's gone. Never to arise again. And Sankara all of these uh, constructs of the mind, thoughts, ideas, views, 
and just one last sankara disappears. The last sankara, no knowledge that now it's gone, never to arise again. The, the consciousness, those are all aspects of consciousness. The consciousness itself, just the magician's trick, arose from emptiness, goes to emptiness, never to arise again. The flame, one more flicker, the last moment of consciousness before the Arahat Parinibbanas and then gone, all gone, all parinibbana, the end of the affliction. Five candles, the Buddha said, a dukkha, and there dukkha has ended. That's what we call parinibbana, complete ending of things. So often in the world, people do not understand what nibbana is because they still have a sense of self. Nibbāna and anatta have to go together. You can't understand one without the other. You can't understand Nibbāna without anatta. You cannot understand anatta without Nibbāna. That's why the first experience of Nibbāna is for the stream winner, when they see anatta. They see both together. Same aspect of the one Dharma of cessation. Seeing that Yankinchi Samudhiya Dhammang Sabantang Niroda Dhammanti, seeing that first experience of the Dhamma of the Buddha. And now it's real, happens. Once one understands Anatta, one understands why Nibbana is a complete ending of all things. There's never anything there anyway, just a process which has now finished its time, turns itself off, and that's it. This is what parinibbana means. Nibbana all around. Nibbana of the arahat. Cause of rebirth is completely gone. Five candles continuing. Parinibbana of the five candles completely disappeared. Sometimes you talk like this. Sometimes people will understand this. Sometimes they'll half understand it. Sometimes they'll think this is completely gobbledygook and they don't want a bar of it doesn't matter. It's in your minds now. One day it will be seen. And when it will be seen, it will be the most beautiful thing in the world. Those people who understand this, the most wonderful thing about our huts is they're happy. Those people who commit suicide in the world, who hang themselves, shoot themselves, jump off a bridge, it's a different type of suicide, as it were, than the other hut. The Arahat is just smiling as they disappear. In the same way, the simile of the Cheshire Cat. Just before the Cheshire Cat, the head in the sky in Alice in the Wonderland completely disappeared, the smile was the last thing left. Then it completely disappeared. That's the Arahat. Everything disappearing. First of all, the body disappearing. Rather, the head disappearing. No ears, no cheeks. No eyes, no nose, no whiskers, just leaving the smile. Five senses disappearing, the body disappearing, just leaving the mind, the smile. And the mind, the last thing which disappears. You enter Parinibbana, as it were, with a huge smile on your face, with a brilliant mind, in fourth jhana, gone. So that's what Nibbana means. So hopefully each one of you will see that. <coughs> will uh, be that and will completely end this cycle of suffering and on the way inspire so many other beings this is the way out of the prison get out of prison and you'll sort of widen the tunnel as you go so other beings can also go through so that's a little talk